Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 971 for September 26th, 2022. Coming up in a few minutes. And we had, you know, little bits and pieces uh, lying around, uh, you know, various documents, uh, obviously a lot of uh, things within family history in itself, um, which were all very uh, useful. But we knew that as a quite a sizable concern in the late 19th and early 20th century that there must be more out there. That initial research into the history of James Eady Limited led to a treasure trove of Barnard-esque proportions, a series of 120 whiskey distillery profiles from 1922 to 1929 that were published in the Wine and Spirit Trade Record and archived in the British Library. That led to the modern-day successor to Alfred Barnard's classic, the new book, The Distilleries of Great Britain and Ireland, A Journey Through the Heartlands of Whiskey, 1922 to 1929. Edie's Leon Kubler joins me later, along with writer Tom Bruce Gardine, who completed the profiles and wrote the introduction for a special whiskey cast in depth. That's just ahead, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, behind the label, and on your voice. And there's a million things out there on the market saying American Single Malt, and right now that doesn't really mean anything. Um, and the uh, what I would consider a pretty minority take on high proof um, is, a, is a good example of, of the variety that's out there that doesn't really let American consumers or global consumers buying American single malts have any idea what... what it, right now it's the Wild West, right? It could be anything in that bottle. Almost. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. Gabriel Cartarella here with Dewar's Whiskey, inviting you to enjoy this episode of Whiskey Cast with a glass of Dewar's, the most awarded blended Scotch whiskey in history. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. You know, people always ask me, does Redbreast go better with ice or without? Would it go well with figs, dark chocolate, apple crumble? Is there one particular thing I should enjoy it with? I tell them, yeah, other people. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by the Dalmore. UK Prime Minister Liz Truss's government is acting on a pledge to cut taxes, and that is good news for whiskey lovers. The previous government had planned to raise excise duty on whiskies and other spirits later this year in line with inflation. But now new Chancellor of the Exchequer Quasi Quarteng has announced a freeze on that and other planned tax hikes. While it's not a tax cut per se, Scotch Whiskey Association CEO Mark Kent said in a video statement that Truss is delivering on her promises to support the Scotch whiskey industry. This will save consumers £1.35 on the average price bottle of Scotch whiskey and help the industry as it deals with the dual challenge of rising energy costs and supply chain pressures. On behalf of the Scotch Whiskey Association's members, I want to thank the government for listening to the concerns of the industry and taking action to support Scotch. The duty freeze will not only support our sector, but the hospitality industry and the wider economy. Further action will be needed to bring down the 70% tax burden on Scotch whisky in the UK, which remains the highest in the G7 and one of the highest in the world. We look forward to working with the new Treasury team to ensure that Scotch whisky can deliver investment, employment and growth in Scotland and across our supply chain. The tax freeze was announced Friday as part of Quarteng's mini-budget address to Parliament. Here's an update on a story we brought you a couple of months ago. An employee of Virginia's Alcoholic Beverage Control Authority has pleaded guilty to illegally copying government data. Edgar Garcia admitted to leaking data on which ABC stores would be getting allocations of rare bourbons. His accused co-conspirator, Rob Adams, has pleaded not guilty to charges he sold that information to members of a Facebook bourbon group. His attorney says Adams did nothing illegal, according to the Washington Post. He is scheduled to go on trial in December. Garcia received a suspended sentence. In other news, Dornock Distillery founders Phil and Simon Thompson told us recently they've run out of room at their distillery. Now they're starting the planning process for building a new one. 
Three more local consultation meetings are set this week before the Thompsons file a formal application with Highlands Council. New whiskeys unveiled this week. Dewar's is evolving its flagship 12-year-old blended scotch. The recipe for the blend remains the same, but now uses first-filled bourbon barrels for the second half of the double-aging process instead of older, inert casks. Master blender Stephanie McLeod told us on Friday night's Happy Hour Live webcast that the idea was inspired by this year's 19-year-old U.S. Open edition. We were working on the Dewar's 19, and we put that into bourbon casks. And we got a really beautiful result from it. And it just seemed to sort of bring the whole blend to life. And so we thought, well, why don't we try that on Dewar's 12 and and see what happens. By double-aging it, in bourbon it 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 amplifies the the vanilla and the the creamy toffee notes that we find when we use bourbon casks and you know this double aging in the bourbon just brings it all to the fore and and really makes for you know i've got some in my glass here um just a really succulent um, and, and, and a really, it's almost enlivened, actually. It's been given a, a boost um, with, with using the bourbon casks. The new version will be working its way out to retailers over the next few months. And, of course, we need to remind you that Dewar's is a sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Glenn Morangie is out with a new limited edition single malt. A Tale of the Forest is made with barley killed with botanicals gathered near Dr. Bill Lumsden's home, including juniper berries, birch bark, and heather. It'll go on sale exclusively at Selfridges in the UK starting next Monday for two weeks until it gets wider distribution. It'll have a recommended retail price of £85 a bottle. Look for a bunch of new travel retail releases in the coming weeks as that segment of the market starts to rebound from the pandemic with a major travel retail conference in Cannes, France. Douglas Lang & Company is releasing its first travel retail exclusive, a limited edition Scallywag Winter Edition blended Speyside malt. The one-liter bottles will carry a recommended retail price of £60 or €70 when they hit shelves next month. White & Mackay is releasing the first single malt from its Scottish Oak program. The Fetter Cairn 18-year-old is finished in Scottish Oak sourced from forests in the Highlands. It'll become an annual limited edition release. No word yet on pricing. And finally, you've probably not heard of Byron Copeland, who was named this week as Manager of Leadership Acceleration and Maturation Innovation at the Jack Daniel Distillery, but his appointment is noteworthy. That's because he's one of the first two graduates of the Nearest and Jack Advancement Initiative program created by Jack Daniels and Uncle Nearest Whiskies and spent the last two years in the program. He was previously an operations team leader at the Jack Daniel Cooperage in Alabama. New candidates for the program will be announced in the coming months. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by the Dalmore. Hello, Richard Patterson here, master distiller, master blender for the Dalmore. You know, whenever the team and I are in the world sharing our exceptional single malt, we like to keep in touch with Mark Gillespie and the latest news from Whiskey Cast. If you missed Friday night's Happy Hour Live webcast with Dewar's master blender Stephanie McLeod, the on demand replay is available right now on the Whiskey Cast YouTube channel. Join us this Friday at a special time, 5 p.m. London time, noon New York time. We'll be coming to you live from the Whiskey Show in London on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Twitter, Twitch, and LinkedIn. Time now for the WhiskeyCast calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. 
In addition to the Whiskey Show in London this week, we also have Whiskey and Barrel Night in Chicago on Thursday night and Whiskey Ottawa in Canada's capital city on Friday and Saturday. The Great American Whiskey Fair returns to Columbia, South Carolina, October 7th. The Whiskey Shop in Dufton, Scotland has its annual Whiskey Colors Festival from the 8th through the 10th. And the Indie Spirits Expo is in Chicago on October 10th. If you're responsible for organizing a whiskey event, please let us know about it. We'll add it to the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. The calendar is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of the Virginia Rye Whiskey. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states and three continents, and online, too. Visit the new buyvirginiarye.com site for more details, and please drink responsibly. Dewar's master blender Stephanie McLeod's innate curiosity, combined with her passion for whiskey maturation, cask finishing, and blending, has created some truly incredible expressions for Dewar's Scotch whiskey. It's also earned her four consecutive Master Blender of the Year titles at the International Whiskey Competition, making her the first person to achieve such an accolade. Her innovative spirit is the inspiration behind the ultra-premium Dewar's Double Double 32 Year, the highest-rated blended Scotch whiskey in the world with a score of 94.4. So whether you consider yourself a whiskey connoisseur or just want to find an exciting new whiskey experience, consider one of Stephanie's other masterful expressions, including Dewar's 15-year, Double Double 21-year, or Dewar's 8-year Mizunara cask finish, and discover just how rewarding curiosity can be. Enjoy responsibly. Whiskey Cast In-Depth is brought to you by Mortlock and the Classic Malts lineup. First edition copies of Alfred Barnard's classic book, The Whiskey Distilleries of the United Kingdom, are extremely rare these days. Barnard wrote his book after visiting 162 different distilleries between 1885 and 1887. About four decades later, the writers of the Wine and Spirit Trade Record profiled 120 whiskey distilleries in the UK and Ireland between 1922 and 1929. It turns out the British Library still has all of those issues in its archives. They came to light when Rupert Patrick decided to revive his great-great-grandfather's Scotch whiskey business seven years ago. At the time, a century ago, James E.D. Limited was one of the major players in the whiskey industry, and while researching the history of the company, those archived issues of the wine and spirit trade record came to light. After years of researching and compiling the monthly essays by Tom Bruce Gardine, they've now been published as a successor to Barnard, The Distilleries of Great Britain and Ireland, A Journey Through the Heartlands of Whiskey, 1922-1929. I talked with Tom Bruce Gardine and Edie's Leon Kubler on a Zoom call this week. What was the genesis for this book? Uh, Obviously, you guys were trying to bring back the James Edie brand. But uh, what was the genesis? Where did you find the source material for this book? Yeah, so um, Mark, the genesis for this book was um, really in the initial research process of, you know, getting the James Eady brands uh, going again. I mean, when we uh, restarted it back in 2015, uh, we knew from Rupert's rich family history that he had a, a whiskey in the family and we had a couple of bottles of it as well. Um, and we had, you know, little bits and pieces uh, lying around, uh, you know, various documents, uh, obviously a lot of uh, things within family history in itself, um, which were all very uh, useful. But we knew that as a, you know, quite a sizable concern in the late 19th and early 20th century that there must be more out there. And even if there wasn't stuff necessarily directly related to ED then there will be lots of other uh, good information out there that would help us put together the kind of you know, world in which he lived, the whiskey world in which he lived in, in particular. Um, so we went to a variety of different uh, sources and locations. Um, one of the outcomes of this was the revival of um, his blended whiskey, James Eady's Trademark X, um, because we found his ledgers in the uh, National Library sorry, the uh, National Brewing Archive 
in Burton on Trent, which is down the road from, from where his brewery was. Um, but we found lots of other information in the British Library, um, which, um, as your readers may or may not know, basically has uh, ev- a copy of every single book published in the United Kingdom going back, you know, at least a century, possibly you know, a couple, best part of a couple. Um, and one of the things that we found in particular was this uh, trade journal called the Wine and Spirit Trade Record, which was um, a really quite a, a remarkable publication. And even more remarkable is that the British Library has virtually every copy from 1898 going up to, I think, 1971, uh, before the, the publication changed and became a much more glossy magazine, you know, maybe uh, more shiny, more interesting uh, advertising copy and so on, but a lot less of the sort of meats and bones of, of the industry in there. Um, so it was really through that process of looking into the James Eady history and, and reviving it, uh, and we came across all sorts of fascinating things, and we probably digested about 10% of you know, all the things that we found just in that one publication alone. Um, but one of the things that really stood out to us was this remarkable series of articles, which lasted for a seven-year period, uh, which covered 124 distilleries, um, four of which actually were gin distilleries, but the vast majority um, were Scotch and Irish, seven Irish, 113 Scotch whiskey distilleries, and more remarkably still, um, with really fantastic, beautiful, crisp, clear uh, photographs from the period. Um, so that was back in 2015. Uh, it's taken about seven years, more or less, to uh, put the whole thing together in the process. Uh, it's been slightly a DC and journey, uh, gone from various uh, different ways of looking at the project and ways of thinking about how we could put the, the project together. Um, but in the end, what we really thought uh, the text warranted and deserved was a almost as close as we could get to a facsimile reproduction, you know, going down to the, the design, the fonts, the even really sort of the colour of the paper used, um, with ultra-high um, photography, by the British Library, who digitised it uh, using the same process that they use for medieval manuscripts. So, you know, this is basically as uh, accurate as, as the uh, photographs can be reproduced within the limits of the reproduction of, you know, early 1920s uh, imagery. I mean, it's uh, remarkably crisp for the day, but, you know, there, there are technical limitations placed on it by the me- methods of printing. Um, and... What we also thought was really important was to do this in a a well-researched and and thorough way, giving context to the uh, contents of the book and uh, what's in there. And also, crucially, what happened next, because this is 100 years ago. And, you know, we'll recognise a lot of the names of the distilleries in this book, but uh, a lot of them didn't make it uh, down to the present day. And then that's where uh, Tom came in. Tom was one of the first, if not the first, person outside of the James Eady company who we introduced the project to. Um, He was, of course, quite taken with it and, um, you know, understood the significance of it. And so he uh, went through and did the research on the introduction and and what came next. And so, yeah, so it's it's been a a project that we've done together in combination really over the course of six or seven years now. It's very nice to finally bring it to the public. Tom, put this book in context with uh, Barnard's classic. Uh, it was written about 40 years before. Yeah. Well, um, so Barnard is the sort of foundation stone of the Scotch whiskey heritage, really. And then we have this great long pause through to the modern day and the reinvention of uh, single malts, really starting with Glenfiddich in the 1960s. So there was this big gap and suddenly we've now got um something very akin to barnard um 40 years down the track and it's at a pivotal point in the industry um just coming out of the uh first world war you've got um all sorts of trends going on you've got a uh, prohibition obviously in america and uh quite how close the uk came to that um, unsure. Lloyd George, uh, the um, wartime 
uh, Premier and before that Chancellor, um, was a very keen um, uh, campaigner for um, abstinence. And um, but he wasn't going to enforce it. He was going to let the individual um, um, counties, um, boroughs, um, parishes decide whether to vote to go dry or not. But, um, you know, this was going on in the background um, to this book. We had the fact that uh, alcohol duty which had always been about raising money for the treasury. Suddenly there was a whole moral dimension to it as a sin tax that had come in. We had um, the DCL getting ever bigger and beginning its great uh, expansion and, and, and amalgamation and buying up and shutting down distilleries to try and keep a lid on supply because uh, the Scotch whisky industry had, uh, had entered the um, 20th century with a massive uh, hangover from the Patterson crash. Um, you know, a classic sort of speculative bubble that had built up after Barnard. You know, Barnard, um, he caught the beginnings of that wave. Um, uh, Scotch was really on a roll and Irish whisky. But, you know, he missed out on the, the whole uh, building boom in, in space side in the 1890s. And, um, you know, that backfired, frankly. And um, that was it took a long time for the industry to, you know, uh, come to terms with, uh, w- with that and just the, the balancing of supply and demand and arguably... You know, it wasn't really until, um, you know, after the Second World War and you had this great long surge in Scotch uh, imports into the United States principally and France and and other markets um, that Scotch really got back into uh, a boom. What did you learn that you didn't know before you read these journals? Well, um, lots and lots of things. Um, I think one thing that struck me was quite how smoky these whiskies were. I mean, you know, classically they were being, uh, the malt uh, was being, you know, the, the dried uh, over a kiln of two, two thirds uh, peat to one third coke. So these would have been really smoky whiskies, even though, you know, Isla was already. Uh, you know, famed for its uh, its its peat smoked whiskies, and I just I've always wondered this whether Scotch struggled um, against Irish whisky, which was in a stronger position uh, certainly at the beginning of the twentieth century, um, sold for a premium uh, Dublin sipping whiskies, which were unsmoked, and so you know that was that was one thing. I think in terms of the process. Um, you're learning, I learned about um, the sort of alcoholic yields that they were getting, which you can work out um, from these, you know, you have to do a very sort of uh, convoluted um, uh, uh, math, a bit of math to um, work out because they're using bushels and imperial uh, uh, gallons and uh, proof gallons. But you can work out that roughly they were getting about 320 uh, litres of alcohol per tonne, which would get you fired as a um, distillery manager today. So they'd be expecting more like 4, 420. Um, and, you know, one can ask the question, you know, what, what, what impact did that have on, on flavour? You know, the, 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 the relentless pursuit of efficiency for the last uh, uh, generation or two um, you know, what did it taste like? You know, these are, these are questions. What do we know about the writers of these articles over that seven-year period? Well, again, I mean, not a lot. It could have been the same person, you know, trying to, you know, judging from the, from the language used. Um, there isn't, you know, unlike Barnard, we know who Alfred Barnard was. We know a picture of him we can we've got a we've got a good good idea of the man himself these articles were anonymous um 
I guess, from from correspondence of of the magazine. I mean, that's that's one of the things that we really tried to get into the weeds and, and discover more on Mark Home. As you can imagine, uh, it is not necessarily the easiest thing to do. I mean, there seems to have been, especially for um, publications of that particular period, there seems to have been a standard which effectively was virtually all articles were written anonymously. Uh, the publication did occasionally uh, put bylines in there, but they were always, uh, as far as I've seen, for pseudonyms, normally you know, Latin names, which clearly were nothing to do with the people that were uh, writing them. But as, as Tom was saying, one of the really kind of fascinating things about the Wine and Spirit trade record is every month, uh, and this continued from, you know, the beginning in uh, 1898, and the magazine actually went back to 1874, but records only go back to 1898, uh, in the British Library at least, and those are the earliest that we found. Uh, but they already had this from our trade correspondence section. And they had correspondence based uh, at various points in the United States, Canada, various regions of Australia. Uh, You had Germany, you had uh, the wine producing regions of France all over. And in in, uh, Scotland and Ireland, you had one in Glasgow or sometimes more than one. Uh, Ditto the same for Edinburgh, the same for the Highlands. Uh, occasionally, certainly in the earlier periods before its uh, decline for Campbelltown as well. And then in Ireland, you had them for Belfast and for Dublin principally as well. And so, you know, my contention is that it's quite possible that maybe there was one author that was doing it. It may well have been submissions from the correspondence that they had uh, on their books. It may well also have been, and this was a theory that was uh, proposed by Nick Morgan in his discussion on the book in The Liquid Antiquarian. Um, It may well have been that it was uh, effectively sent, copy was sent to the uh, central headquarters of the Wine and Spirit Trade Record and then was uh, written by a copywriter back in in the headquarters. So there's, there's various different theories. If anyone out there is able to find out more, we would absolutely love to find out more about this. Um, but for me personally, I quite like that there's a, an element of mystique to the author behind, or authors indeed, behind this um, publication. You mentioned Campbellton, and this really sort of uh, brings the decline of Campbellton whiskies into a perspective, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. And um, but as uh, Leon has pointed out bef- to others before, that uh, there's no sense in the in the profiles of the Campbelltown whiskies that the end was nigh, and you know very soon. I mean, in a matter of years, uh, these distilleries disappeared uh, for good. And uh, you know, as we know, Campbelltown, um, you know, crawled into the 1930s with just. Uh, I think one distillery still going and then soon Springbank uh, and uh, Glen Scotia uh, uh, survived too. And, and yeah, a, a re- incredible demise. I mean, especially when you, when you see the, the third article in the book is Hazelburn and the first paragraph, uh, it, it begins, Hazelburn Distillery is one of many in Campbelltown that have recently come under new management with exceedingly beneficial results. The paragraph ends with Hazelburn Distillery has undergone changes which may legitimately be described as revolutionary. Uh, that was in 1922, and by 1925, it closed its doors for the final time. And, and you know, with the, the Campbelltown distilleries in there, I mean, you see these uh, pictures. I mean, I've got to be honest, they don't look like they've undergone revolutionary modernization, certainly in terms of the, the machinery and so on, compared to some of the other distilleries. But you do get a sense of the early optimism uh, of the 1920s, you know, coming out of uh, the First World War, coming out of a pandemic, uh, coming out of uh, the immediate post-war recession, that things may well get better. Uh, and and that's certainly reflected not just in Campbelltown and elsewhere. And, and really one of the other interesting dynamics of the book is, as time goes on, the optimism of the first couple of years 
really declines into the realization that you know with the general strike with the continuation of prohibition with um the the world economy and the world in general not being in a very happy place as the 1920s went on you know that change of mood is is to my mind reflected in the later articles that come through as well it's fun to look at this and see what was state of the art back in that time period i know that uh Looking at the description for the Jones's Road Distillery in Dublin, they're talking about bragging about the fact that they had just put in asbestos in their warehouse. <laughs> yeah. And another distillery that had figured out a unique method of getting rid of its waste products by pumping them out into the Firth, yeah. which environmentalists would cringe at today. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few uh, like that. And what, one other thought I had about... Um, what I learned was how much, um, you know, the single malts and the distilleries, you know, actually were, you know, they, they mattered. They, they were, they were out there and they were, they had a name, they had a reputation above all, they had a magazine like this one that was keen to profile them because they, their readership, which certainly wasn't, wasn't all distillers and, and what have you, you know, were genuinely fond and, and and interested in the places where these whiskies were made. Ten years on, it, very hard to imagine uh, anyone was particularly interested. And I mean, you know, single malts as such, you know, <laughs> was were were buried under a stampede of the all conquering blends. Leon, what did you learn from this work that uh, has influenced your work at James Eady Limited? Um, yeah, v- very good question, Mark, actually. Um, I mean, really what we try and do with James Eady is we always try to use the sort of rich heritage, both both of the whiskey in, industry in general and whiskey from the past, and also of the James Eady business. So, you know, Trademark X was a revival of James Eady's a blend using only the whiskies that James Eady himself was buying 100 years ago in his ledger. Uh, our cask finish program, we do additional maturations only in the kind of wood that um, James Eady himself was using in his warehouse. So sherry, Madeira, uh, Malaga, um, brandy cask and Marsala cask. Um, and so this has always been at the core of what we are aiming to do with James Eady and, and is what we continue to try and do now one of the challenges with this book is that the uh, references to the kind of flavor profiles of the whiskies um, and even really the kinds of woods that they were matured in and so on and so forth are somewhat fleeting Uh, so there's an element of having to read the tea leaves on there I know there's a couple of distilleries early on where they talk about, you know, the perfect age or the perfect wood uh, that whiskey should be um, matured in. I mean, I, I vaguely remember Lafroig has said it being best at five years old in a sherry cask. Um, so, I mean, it, these are sort of the things that we are looking to do with our um, products to try and, uh, yeah, look maybe to exploring younger whiskies, focusing on distillery character with the kind of wood and so on. Um, it has also opened maybe something of a Pandora's box in terms of giving us really the encouragement to find other resources and, and other things that may be out there uh, that we can do. And, uh, you know, I, this first book took seven years to do. Uh, at this moment in time, I'm not sure I can stomach the concept of doing another, but I mean, who knows? So <laughs> we shall see. We shall see. The Distilleries of Great Britain and Ireland is available exclusively through Royal Mile Whiskies, which has been shipping copies of them throughout the world. I was sent a review copy, and it'll have a place in my library for years to come. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth. It's brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies, comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. 
First off, let's look at this year's Octomore series of Iowa single malts from Brook Laddie. It's the 13th series of releases, and 13.1 is, as always, distilled from 100% Scottish barley and matured for five years in ex-bourbon casks. Though this year's release was moved into a new set of first fill ex-bourbon casks for the final year of maturation. It's peated to 137.3 parts per million of phenols and bottled at 59.2% ABV. The nose has the expected peat smoke along with touches of heather, honey, dried fruits, and a good maltiness. The taste is peaty with notes of grilled fruits, honey, barley sugar, and hints of cinnamon and black pepper. The finish is smoky with a nice underlying maltiness. I'm scoring the Octomore 13.1 a 93. Now 13.2 is also peated to 137.3 parts per million, but it's matured for five years in first fill Oloroso sherry casks and bottled at 58.3% ABV. The nose is nutty with a lingering smokiness and hints of orange peel, figs, honey, and dried fruits. The taste is fruity with a sweet smokiness that builds to an intense crescendo, backed by touches of orange peel, dried fruits, honey, and white pepper. The finish is long, with a gently lingering smokiness and hints of grilled citrus and dried fruits. I'm scoring the Octomore 12.2 a 94. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit, a 100-time award-winning Maryland-style rye whiskey. With a determined focus to create the best rye whiskey imaginable, Sagamore's team of distillers crafts each spirit with a nod to both tradition and innovation. Find their signature, Double Oak, Cask Strength, or Reserve Series of Ryes, as well as their line of premium rye whiskey canned cocktails, at a retailer near you. Visit sagamorespirit.com slash find dash rye. Please drink responsibly. Now, Octomore 13.3 is made from barley grown on Andrew Brown's Octomore Farm on Isla. This year's edition is peated to 129.3 parts per million of phenols, and it's matured for five years in a combination of first-fill American whiskey and second-fill European oak casks. It's bottled at 61.1% ABV. The nose has a gentle smokiness with hints of green apples, honey, vanilla, and brown sugar. The taste has a good peatiness with hints of brine and creosote, along with notes of green apples, vanilla, brown sugar, and honey. The finish is nice and long with a gentle smokiness and touches of grilled fruits, sea salt, and honey. I'm scoring the Octomore 13.3 a 93. Finally, let's look at the new Dewar's 12-year-old. As we heard during the news, its second maturation comes in first fill ex-bourbon barrels now, and it's bottled at 40% ABV. The first thing you notice is the lush and creamy mouthfeel. It lingers on the palate with an incredible balance of light smokiness and faint floral notes that dissolve into peaches, vanilla, and autumn spiced apples. The richness and complexity continues to bloom long after you finish your sip, and overall it's a stunning surprise. The nose is complex with touches of lemon zest, flowers, peaches, red apples, and butterscotch to complement the barest whiff of smoke, while the finish is long and creamy with smoky peaches, butterscotch, and ginger. With this release, Dewar's raises the bar on blended scotch whiskey and it's a testament to the artistry of blending. It drinks a lot more expensively than it is, and it should spark some excitement within the often dismissed category of blended scotch whiskeys. I'm scoring the new Dewar's 12-year-old a 94. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 3,400 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Kentucky and Ireland have plenty in common. Two homes of horse racing. Mm-hmm. Bluegrass music is said to have Irish roots. Um, okay, it's not the longest list, but the Redbreast Kentucky Oak Edition only strengthens the bond. 
finished in sustainably sourced Kentucky oak for a captivating nose and round taste. I see a triple crown in this thoroughbred's future. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice, presented by Scarabus Isla Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. Our interview two weeks ago with Phil Steger of Minnesota's Brother Justice Distilling has generated a lot of feedback within the distilling community, all of it negative. He's critical of the proposed standard of identity for American single malt whiskeys that's currently in a public comment period at the Treasury Department's Tax and Trade Bureau. Here's a little of what he had to say two weeks ago. We're innovating American single malt whiskeys based on the Scotch definition. Um, of single malt, which is the only definition that really consumers recognize and is the standard of the category really worldwide. And in Scotch distillation tradition, you can, and actually it's critical to be able to distill up to 190 proof, not equal to, but up to 190 proof. And that's where we started. Um, And that's what we've built our entire, we've innovated our complete line of single malts based on that. And so it would be devastating to us. It would wipe out over 10 years and several million dollars of research and development of American single malts that have been approved by the TTB um, and that match the Scotch definition. The comments I've received since that interview specifically challenged Phil Steger on a number of points and suggested that I should have called him out on things he either got confused or just plain has wrong. Instead, I'm giving them a chance to respond. Jared Hempstead of Balconis Distilling is one of the founders of the American Single Malt Whiskey Commission, which proposed the definition that the TTB is looking at using, and here is his take. I'm not super interested in just critiquing uh, his his take. The, the thing that sticks out to me about that that line of reasoning is ironically for me, it felt like this is exactly why we need a definition. Um, currently, most things that are on the market as American single malts, as he pointed out, are those words are separate from the word whiskey, which I think that's, what, what, I can't remember what the code is for that. Is that, is that 401, whatever, the, just the parent category of whiskey is. Um, and there's a million things out there on the market saying American single malt, and right now that doesn't really mean anything. Um, and the, I would, I would consider a pretty minority take on high proof, um, is a, is a good example of, of the variety that's out there that doesn't really let American consumers or global consumers buying American single malts have any idea what, what it, right now it's the wild west, right? It could be anything in that bottle almost. Um, I think it's interesting too, there was a lot of pointing to Scotch traditions, but, but even then a little bit of picking and choosing, right? I mean, um, the scotch, the parent category can be up to 190 proof, but that's true for American whiskey tr- too, right? The parent category of whiskey allows up to 190. But then when you're actually looking at specific standards of identity, there's very few that allow for that. You know, almost everything that's over 160 is going to be spirit whiskey, blended stuff, light whiskey, things like that. Not, none of the core categories, um, you know, rye, bourbon, corn, malt, um, the straight variants of those, none of those are going to be allowed to go that high. And there's a reason for that. Um, you know, what, it, as, we, as we all know, you're going to, that's, you're getting into a neutral grade spirit t- category at that point when you're going that high with distillation. I thought that was interesting to comment on that as technicality over scotch whiskey period but that is not um yeah i don't know anybody maybe you know better than me i I can't think of anybody that's doing single malt that's that's going to be pulling off at 190 not to mention with a pot still i don't think that's technically even possible um which is another pretty major aspect of both irish and scottish traditions if you're going to be doing single malt that's going to be on a pot um so that the, the the picking and choosing of this from here and this from here, uh, you know, it's, it just kind of feels like that's exactly why we need to kind of articulate something so that the whole world knows what that means. Um, and also American single malt distillers have been saying from day one that, that the goal wasn't to try and emulate scotch. And that's totally cool if that's, you know, what some American distillers 
if that's exactly when they, what they want to do, I want to make that. I just want to make it in our backyard. There's nothing wrong with that. And our definition doesn't, you know, disallow anyone from doing that. Um, but it definitely doesn't, that's not an, that's not a, uh, a representative take in my opinion on what American single malt has been doing for the last 10, 15 plus years. It's not been an attempt to emulate scotch and just do it in our own state. So, um, yeah, there's some nuance to the definition that we came up with partly because we were trying to, to, uh, reference global understanding of what single malts are at the same time, having to respect what is already set in precedent with American regs, like bottling over 40, you know, distilling under 160, uh, you know, it's going to be a non-starter if you go to the TTB and say, Hey, we want to be the one category that can barrel over 62.5. I mean, you know what I mean? There's some pragmatics involved to, to getting something like this through that, uh, you know, so we, there's some American stuff. There's also some international stuff with a nod to tradition, but also a nod to export. Can we keep some of the stuff kind of tidy? And then all we have to talk about are some of the things that are different, you know, like we don't have a pot still definition in American regs. So that's a one more step if you designate that. Not not only that, but that would kind of limit American distillers' ingenuity, just like limiting the barrel of type or you know something like that. Um, so it was definitely a, a juggle of American regs, international regs, and just consumer expectation, all the while trying to come up with something that can support and defend um, all the innovation that's been going on with with craft producers in the U.S. for the last 10, 15 years. So um, it wasn't easy to come up with, but you know. Um, even honestly, even some of the science, I think, you know, misinformation is a strong word, but some of the takes are, are definitely outlier takes, you know, the higher proof, nothing about, there's nothing about higher proof. That's going to help you make tighter cuts. You can make tight cuts between 58 and 60 ABV off the stills or 67 to 68 or super high, like tight cuts are tight cuts. You know, um, there's nothing about doing it in any given place that makes it clean you know, makes it tighter or more specific. And, and, you know, you're talking about congeners being up there, you know, that's, that's alcohols that are up there, you know, which is why vodka comes off a column. that's super high proof. Um, so yeah, I can congeners think of a, are down lower, right? Well, exactly. I can think of a million things that are going to be way too heavy. You know, the boiling point and evaporation point on some of these particles is just going to be, you, you know, you're, there's just a bunch of stuff you're never going to get if you're making off that proof um, that are absolutely part of tradition. I mean, I can't, once again, I can't think of anybody that I know of that's pulling single malt off the stills in Scotland or Ireland or anywhere at anywhere near 190. You know, that's maybe above 160 a little bit, but not by much. The um, only one I can think of is Pendrin in Wales, but they're using a Faraday still. Hmm with a vacuum and they pull it off at something like 92%. Yeah. But that's, that's a different not, type of still altogether. And that's probably not being labeled as single malt. Yeah. It's being labeled as single malt. It is. Malt. Okay. Well, once again, the references were to Scottish tradition. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, 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 and also it, it's cool to look back at Scotland and Ireland as the, you know, the origins of some of this tradition, but, you know, to not talk about what's been happening in Japan, Taiwan, India, U.S., Australia, New Zealand, it just kind of sounds like you were you were on vacation for the last ten years. If if the only thing about single malt you can think of to talk about is Scotch, you know, um, it's 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 uh, absolutely a global trend and phenomenon and massively growing category um, that has a lot of nuance to it, and so you know. Yeah. The public comment period officially ends on Tuesday, and a final ruling from the TTB could come at any point in the coming months once agency officials review all of the comments. Now, if you have a question, suggestion, or anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find me on social media. Look for WhiskeyCast on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, or just email me. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Scarabus, the Isla single malt from Hunter Lang and Company that celebrates all of Isla's natural gifts in one bottle. Only those who seek shall find Scarabus. Start your search at hunterlang.com. 
Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and people who make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Accelerating the speed at which whiskey matures has been sort of a holy grail for distillers. Almost every major whiskey company has conducted experiments over the years to see what works and what doesn't. And they've all concluded so far that the only combination that really works is whiskey, wood, and time. Not to say that others haven't tried to sell their snake oil techniques. For instance, in the distilleries of Great Britain and Ireland, the chapter on John Jameson's Bow Street Distillery in Dublin shares this story. Reading now. When it was known that John kept his whiskey for years, the cynics of the trade scoffed at him, but they did not make him deviate from his determination. A story is told of a man who took him a mysterious chemical concoction, which he claimed would give the new spirit the flavor of ten-year-old whiskey. Man, exclaimed John, bring me a mixture that will make an old man young, then I'll let you use your physic to make young whiskey old, but not till then. And that's not happening anytime soon. If you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, an 18th century style of premium Irish whiskey, blended from single pot still and single malt. Like yourself, it's one of life's treasured rarities. And what's rare? is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course a complete archive of all of our past episodes going all the way back to 2005. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. People never forget the person who introduced them to Redbreast. And then those people go on to introduce others to Redbreast. And soon the flock has grown exponentially. It's like a pyramid scheme. Without any of the bad stuff, of course. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Well, folks, we're nearing the end of another great episode of WhiskeyCast, which means you're probably craving some whiskey. Head on over to Dewars.com or your local retailer to discover what makes Dewars the most awarded blended Scotch whiskey in the world. WhiskeyCast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2022. And comes to you each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.